Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tony Zernun, and on behalf of Tortora Brida Institute, I would like to welcome you to our roundtable event called, How Do We Stay Ahead of Insider Threats? Before we begin, I'd like to share a little about Tortora Brida Institute and our sponsor. The Tortora Brida Institute was created to promote collaboration across public and private sectors with a focus on business, culture, and diversity. We are looking to reshape and develop collaboration and partnering practices with a view to improving and securing business and economies. A core concept of the Institute is our think tank for partnership excellence. The think tank has allowed us to bring together experts from and leaders from public and private sectors and academia from around the world to reshape and develop collaboration and partnering practices while embracing the most critical technology growth. If you're not currently a member of the Institute, I highly uh, recommend that you visit tortribrida.org and invite you to um, learn more about the Institute and see how you can participate. I also want to extend a special thank you to our sponsor for this event, Gorilla Corporation. Gorilla Corporation is a leading global sales, marketing and technology channel development company with a focus on serving the technology industry. At this time, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and introduce the panelists for today's discussions. My name is Tony Zernun. Um, I have been in industry in cybersecurity for about 20 plus years. I've had the pleasure of working at large and small uh, companies. I've been a practitioner and I've uh, worked at consulting practices, doing risk management, as well as working on the solution side, uh, doing competitive and technical marketing around data pr uh, protection, data leak prevention, so I would say I had dabbled on some aspects of Insight Thread. I'm not an expert, but I've uh, tried to passionately try to contribute to that. Uh, in the last decades, I realized it takes a village. So I've started focusing on building partnership, the strategic alliances, and looking at the strategies that uh, hopefully <clears throat> help us um, uh, change the balance that we have today in this asymmetrical war and move us to more of a defeat by design strategy. Um, so that has brought me to a zero trust um, strategy at a company called AppGate. I lead the strategic partnership and alliances at AppGate, uh, where we are a leader of zero trust network access. And my goal there is to continue to enhance the platform as um, a contextual intelligence aware and dynamic zero trust access following the zero trust um, reference architecture. With me, I wanted to uh, take a moment and introduce our panelists. So uh, without a further ado, if I can share this um, properly, give me one sec, I believe this sh should work. So Costa Vilk, uh, Costa and I have interacted <clears throat> in various different roles in the industry. And um, I've uh, not only grown to have a good friendship and a lot of respect, Costa is an information systems executive who's experienced uh, CXO. He has created and uh, exited award-winning companies in addition to teaching university level courses in information technology. He is very passionate about helping companies create incredible products, amazing brands, powerful marketing stories, and high performance teams. Coast has extensive experience in quantum computing, quantum cryptography, AI, cybersecurity, cloud innovation, marketing, sales, m and He's done it uh, pretty much around. <laughs> Uh, what it takes to go from idea concept to actually make it happen. Um, before founding QSecure, um, when I met Costa, he was uh, founding the uh, Quantum Thought Institute, if I remember correctly, Costa, a pre quantum computing launchpad for the founding generation of quantum computing companies, helping us future-proof whatever it is that we're making today. He also created an award-winning company named ISBAN, which became a leading partner in the transformation of corporate systems to the cloud. He's recognized as one of the top CTOs in the quantum computing field and is known for his contributions to Forbes. Costa, thank you. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank um, you very next, much. we have uh, Michael Friedrich. Um, Michael and I have uh, collaborated uh, intensely with my short tenure at AppGate. Um, he is currently a digital, is a digital portfolio manager at Lomaxis. Um, Michael serves as a digital uh, portfolio manager for Lamaxis. This portfolio covers zero trust, AI, cloud solutions, and uh, he has served in several senior leadership and engineering roles in AppGate and throughout their journeys from Sixera to Savas to Termark and Ryzen, as well as IBM. 
as VPF AppGate and Sixera were interacted with uh, Michael, he led the engineering compliance and product efforts that helped bring Zero Trust into uh, US uh, Department of Defense. He also developed some of the largest and most complex cloud solutions, uh, cloud hosted solutions for United States Department of Veterans Affairs. This solution dealt with the complex needs for securing the information of every veteran of the United States and these veterans ability to interact with VA to realize benefits uh, earned through their service. For that, I thank you, uh, Michael. Appreciate that from uh, on behalf of everybody. Uh, Michael Engineering Knowledge covers zero trust, software defined perimeter security, uh, cybersecurity, cloud architecture, solutions, integration, compliance, networking, and product management engineering. That pretty much covers the entire gamut, Michael. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, next, I have Moshe and Simon. Uh, Moshe and I interacted um, at a company called Trapex. And uh, Moshe is entrepreneurial and driven uh, chief executive with 20 years of expertise, experience in IT security, extremely passionate about what he does, uh, focused on customer delight. I've had the first hand experience of working with him in the trenches. He has built and led world-class technology management, product management, sales teams, especially in startups, things that he knew and things that he didn't know, he's done it. He got from a concept to building a company, to building a market. He's proven fundraising, networking skills, things that probably Moshe, I'm not sure if you, you enjoyed as much as uh, you know making solutions, but um, I guess it was a, a very good experience um, you know, going through this. Um, some of the you know, achievements that um, I have captured here is, um, you established uh, the deception market of your experience in deception space, co-founded uh, Traffic Security. Uh, you were a CEO of Injection Security, a security consulting firm focusing on offensive security, exploit um, writer, malware analysis, and more. You were also on the other side, the defender side, CISO of Dexia in Israel Bank, CISO at HCSRA, an insurance company. And uh, you were four years in uh, Israeli Air Force and practical uh, engineering degree for those that understand what that means exactly. You were not academic, you were hands-on. And I guess you could provide us the insight uh, into the insider's mind. You've been on that side. Thank you, Moshe, for joining us. And I know it's late uh, in, in Israel and we really appreciate it. And last but not least, I have Brian Stoner. <clears throat> and Brian, you and I interacted uh at different companies um and uh uh very happy to have you here as well brian Sorner is a seasoned channel executive in cybersecurity. he's currently leading the charge uh for channels and alliances at dtex and uh, it's a company that provides insider threat dlp forensic solution for large companies and before dtex he held leadership position at mcafee fireeye silence and stellar cyber uh, brian is very active in mssb community has written numerous articles for MSB alerts and is also active in doing podcasts and MSB alliances. I think, um, Brian, you can also bring the voice of uh, the partners and uh, so help us also realize that we have another challenge and that is a huge talent and skills gap when it comes to dealing with this. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me here. And uh, just to, before we get started, I wanted to kind of share a little bit tidbits that I've been gathering. This is probably already stale, so I'll open it up and we can bring more updated uh, as of two weeks ago when I captured this. So when I look at insider threats, uh, um, you know, 90% uh, of organizations feel vulnerable to insider th attacks. That to me was, you know, um, very refreshing. At least they know. Um, this one was interesting. Two third of cyber claims reported to insurers are caused by employee negligence and malfeasance. That one was a shocker. 66% of organization consider malicious insider attacks or accidental breaches more likely than external attacks. Uh, while banking, government, and healthcare are the top three, but I guess every in, uh, industry is affected by insider incidents. Mm -hmm. I thought that only meant Snowden, but I guess we'll talk that maybe it's not just limited to Snowden or finding the next Snowden. Fraud is top motivation for banking whereas sabotage and IP theft are the ones for IT. So different motivation for different industries. And according to Panaman Institute, uh, the number of cyber threat incidents caused by insiders rose by 47% from 2018 to 2020. The cost reached over $11 million. 
And one third of electronic crimes were caused by insiders. 34% of business experiences uh, experience some kind of insider uh, attack every year. And 67 claim that are experiencing between 21 and 40 incidents per year. Brian, I'll ask you this. Let's start with this, basics. Who is insider? What is insider? Well, Tony, that's kind of an evolving thing, especially, you know, here at DTEX, right? Um, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, the insider is my employee that has EDR on their endpoint, right? Um, but it could be the guy who cleans out the garbage cans at night, who has a badge access. It could be um, a contractor. It could be a trusted service provider that a company works with. I think um, that that definition of insider threat is evolving as we see all these different new attacks. And, um, you know, I think it's time for people to really kind of open up that aperture to the definition of insider, uh, because it could even be misconfigured machines in your environment. Mm -hmm. It could be, um, you know, a, a compromised user or a compromised user account. And, um, you know, today's approach to trying to solve that with the SIM has proven to be pretty ineffective, unfortunately. Absolutely. Um, Costa, um, any additional thoughts on that? Any other uh, personas, people that we need to consider? Really helps to unmute. You know, um, uh, working on the uh, working in the quantum field, we're actually seeing um, a lot of the man in the middle type of attacks, especially by uh, leveraging the internal infrastructure of the companies that actually um, acts to compromise the, uh, the communication channel itself. So whereas we used to fight all of the traditional insiders that uh, Brian uh, mentioned, there is this other element of uh, truly malicious attacks uh, and targeted ones specifically that uh, they try to intercept communications. And that's, uh, uh, and that's a new frontier that we're seeing right now because these, uh, um, protocols that we use for to secure our communication even communication between the machines and devices is mm -hmm. no longer considered to be secure so that's one of the areas that we tackle yeah and i guess with with the you know advent of uh, work from home hybrid you know pretty much anybody i guess brian when you said is anybody with a badge or a vpn access <clears throat> to resources on what seem to be trusted communication uh, channels mm -hmm trusted systems, you know, maybe our suppliers, you mentioned the janitors. So I think we, we need to expand that, understand anybody who has access to information, resources, infrastructure, whether it's on-prem, remote, whether it's temporary on a contractor basis, uh, let's call them, I don't know, a mule or a shadow, somebody comes in service temporarily, right? These are all potential insiders. Would you agree? So, um, Moshe, Let's let's kind of expand on this. What is what constitutes insider threat? What is a threat? So when you look at insider threat uh, paradigm, look insider threat uh, in the industry is always uh, you know kind of uh, attached to a, a person in in the organization. But you know we see cases where basically somebody hires somebody to to be a worker and and still the data but you can see cases especially in the in in the latin america region uh, you can see a, a cases where they you know come to the company for one week inject the malware the back door and just disappear you don't see them so it's it's a dynamic of insider threat i call it because it starts as a person they join the company mm -hmm. And one week after one week, he disappear. Say that he can, he just you know, resign and and disappear. And and but he you know for one week he put and plug his tools inside. And from this point, uh, the internal desktop, no matter if it's an under a new employee or just you know an idle desktop, uh, become the insider threat. So we get regular to see people that sitting for months of or years in the organization, learning, searching, digging, try to find the data and collect it in an elegant way. Today, we see people 
show up for a one week, several days and disappear and, and the malware become the insider threat using and leverage other identity in the organization that have no clue that somebody be half of them stealing the data and take, it, take the data out. Mm-hmm. One of the mm-hmm. interesting cases that we deal with in, in, in the angle of deception was the fact that somebody joined a bank uh, after three days putting his tools inside and, and just resign. And we start seeing the data not getting out on command and control. They just copy the data to one of his colleagues in the organization on mm-hmm. his laptop. So each time he go mm-hmm. home with the laptop and the laptop connect to the internet, all the data is go out. So mm-hmm. it's insider threat, not insider. It's a good question. If you ask me, this is the new dynamic of insider threat. People mm-hmm. has the, have the feeling that oh, we need to find a person but it's not person anymore. The person is just the trigger. And from this point, the insider threat get affiliate or get infected with each one of the people in the organization. And if your laptop start up the, uploading data outside and there is a trace, you know, you become the, you're the insider without even know that you are the insider. Right. So it's an interesting to see the, the shifting in the industry. And basically we see it quite a bit with the deception solution because end of the day, we insert fake data into the organization systems. And I always telling people that deception not produce false positive because nobody will touch something fake unless he has goes in to do it. But if somebody from your organization touch the data, you automatically become the insider. And it's allow us to find people that join the company and try to find a way to inject malware or find a way to uh, escalate privilege, period escalation, and et cetera. They try to leverage the fake data inside the organization. And one of the things that we see that we detect somebody and, and the feedback we get, hey, this guy just joined the company one week ago. So it's interesting to see the involvement of this insider threat in general in organization. Thank you. So <clears throat> what, what I'm hearing is that these guys are very tenacious. They're very motivated, but they're also very patient and they're very crafty. It seems to me that we're talking about an insider threat by design, right? You mentioned, you know, uh, folks that are coming there. Some of them may be known. I think there was a comment uh, about bribe. Uh, many of them could be uh, bribed, extorted to be that uh, pivot point. Um, there are um, probably other type of threats, right? So we, we talked about this, but I think last we spoke, we also mentioned curiosity. Um, we certainly have heard espionage, right? The Snowden uh, terrorism. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, given the, the dynamics, I guess there is uh, disgruntled employees and things. Um, Michael, wh- what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I give you a great example that kind of builds off of, of what was just talked about, right? So there's just a, a newly released what they're calling attack in the middle. And this is going to be a target that's going to go after government and larger industry, right? So the attack in the middle example is specifically phishing. So getting to a user who doesn't intend to be the pivot point to start the attack, they fish them, get them to enter their credentials into a fake site that looks like the original. So an outlook, a bank or whatever. And now what they're doing is jumping a man in the middle and they're attacking to grab the session token for the MFA And they're replaying that token. And now all of a sudden they bypassed MFA. They've got your credentials and now they're into the organization and they can pivot. So this whole concept of a user and device being separate pivot points of an insider, it could be the accidental insider who gets clicks on the wrong thing. It could be the iOS attack that they had to run and patch that gave the device a pivot point in. There's so many angles to this to think about what, what is the goal of the attack? How do you manage it? And how do you build a risk framework, right? If you're talking about this in the in a, in a zero trust mentality of how to prevent these, you've got to start breaking down just not the persona of the person, but the devices and their roles and figuring out what they should have access to, right? Where where do they belong? So that could be a point, right? So to to, to Moshe's point, right? Somebody, you know, that that device is suddenly beaconing out on the internet, but what has that device touched on the network, right? The mm-hmm. more you can control <laughs> that, the better your odds of limiting the damage or preventing it in the first place. So it sounds like these guys are not just attacking technology and controls, but rather going after uh, processes, assume processes, you know, we're trying to solve the password uh, problem. 
we're getting people to go to MFA and what you just told me this men and men uh what do you call it? not a man in the middle man in the they're calling it an attack in the middle right because attack in the middle yep. yeah yeah so attack in the middle right they didn't it sounds like they're going after processes i said they're getting a lot more sophisticated um as we're trying to unpack this so there are probably different type of insider threats that we talked about right um so uh, brian uh, maybe you can uh expand that what types of insider threats i know we talked about you know intentional ones what are some of the other ones well, so obviously there's unintentional, right? Um, people who are just, you know, lazy or aren't following, you know, security protocols. Um, it could be negligence. It could be accidental. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's just so many different, I mean, we're dealing with humans here. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the challenges, we try to solve this problem with technology all the time, um, but, mm-hmm. but we're really dealing with humans. And until you can kind of measure um, their activities in context, you can see a lot of different alerts, but not really understand the intentionality of, mm-hmm. of what they're doing. And, mm-hmm. you know, we actually partner with MITRE and um, have a matrix of, you know, over a thousand different behaviors that can be put into those kind of different buckets. Um, so you can begin to understand, you know, is this somebody who just needs, you know, a nudge? Is this somebody that needs to be told you need to stick to policy? Or is this mm-hmm. someone who needs to sit down with HR and IT and, you know, find out what's really going on, right? So, um, you know, I, yeah, I think we just need to kind of evolve how we deal with these things and not treat it as an IT problem, but mm-hmm. treat it as a people problem. I, I think that that's a key point, right? I think, um, to me, what you, what you mentioned is remind me that people are fallible and are gullible, right? They fail and you tell them about don't click on stuff right qr codes are just links stop you know treating like it's a harmless thing and or they are too curious right or they're too gullible and they will click on stuff um one we need to put the measures that people making those kind of mistakes um doesn't change your risk profile and i got i guess the other um profile sounds like the people who go to defcon and come back and they're extra curious i know that Moshe was uh mentioning that right somebody went to defcon and suddenly got a root you know a, a toolkit like you got a bump key and you start going and you know doing the physical stuff and this guy's coming and running you know uh port scans and creating a lot of noise for people and so your team is already oversubscribed dealing with alert fatigue and you just created additional fires that are distracting them right um it, there, there's this concept of uh, collusion and third party and i think there was a comment also about supply chain right so we'll see that, you know, who wants to comment about that? I think there was a question about, we call it supply chain um, attacks, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's here, you can see it on the chat, right? Um, Rufo is talking, insider threat uh, includes most of what is often referred to as supply chain attacks these days. Any comments on that? So Tony, before we get there, one thing I wanted to add on to Brian's comment, I think would be an interesting conversation is the BYOD phenomenon that's growing, right? Whether it's industry or government, that that is another point of the users are going to look at things on their personal devices. And how are you as an organization? How do you educate them? And how do you prevent that device or that user from doing the wrong thing, right? They may have a VPN <clears throat> access, they may have a software defined perimeter client, but uh, the other side of that laptop is theirs, right? And what you can control bits of behavior when they're connected, but what happens when they're not, <clears> right? <throat> and it goes to Moshe's point of, right? They come in, they download, maybe they're downloading other stuff. All of a sudden it's on the public internet. You have no idea what's happening with that device. And that device is now exfiltrating data, right? If they want to be insidious, right? So yep. I, I just think that's a point we didn't hit on in that conversation, but I think it goes to, to Brian's point about, that human factor, right? Because we've moved into this BYOD world now, whether in industry and government. Yeah, I think you touched on a very important point, which is the intersection of privacy versus security, right? I mean, you know, there, there, there's a huge investment on privacy side. I mean, you can put so much security, right? At what point you're infringing on somebody else's privacy? And I guess the bad guys also notice, and they're going to try to find, you know, those gray areas where it's harder for you to, to uh, provide governance over. Um, so we talked about what is insider, who's insider, insider types, and um, let's just recap. You know, so when we talk about an insider threat occurs, what what really happens, right? Um, you know, wh- what is the process? Motion probably can, you know, um, 
talk about it and then may see it maybe uh, expand that right um what goes into the the the, the i guess the process of um you know there, there's probably just like in a you know the kill chain process there's probably a process right for insider to become an insider yeah basically you need a sponsor because somebody mm -hmm. pay for somebody the the, the good in, the professional insider if i can say always hire somebody to do so you need the you need the sponsor mm -hmm. and you need the motivation <clears throat> and you need the person that will take the take the, the job so this is basically what i call the recon phase so mm -hmm. it's basically mapping looking try to understand how the organization work what is the hiring process what is the how the organization treat to security you know you 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 have some to do some study on the organization and by mm -hmm. the way if 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 i go back to my day in the dark the day when we collect threat intelligence so big part of insider was a, a penetration test from from the outside to inside just to feel the organization like what is the system what the people have because most of the time you send an insider that is not a professional hacker it's a person that need to give the organization feeling that is a you know as a standard employee that just you know come to to be an sdr or somebody that just you know make phone calls or, or secretary and etc mm -hmm. so you feel the ground. yeah you feel the mm -hmm. ground you try to map the organization and what is the reaction to some uh, you know simulated breach and because you need to give the the person tools and direction then you bring the, the the person and you need to decide if it's a job that he will do himself or he will be just the proxy for it as i mentioned mm -hmm. till three five four years ago it was always a human person that do the whole job from a to z and mm -hmm. in the last four years we just seen people joining a company for you know very short period and injecting the malware mm -hmm. and just you know getting off and and just letting the job uh, uh, run mm -hmm. but long story short the the one that really harmed the organization is the one that the insider threat sit for long time either human on 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 apt right. and collecting not just the current data also the future data because the dynamic show us that when you start stealing the data and reading and analyze the data you understand the the future and the plan of the organization so you want to be there to keep stealing the secret the upcoming secret it's not like a mm -hmm. one time job most of the insider traded investigation that i was part of the investigation team or the detection team it was all, always a long term uh, cycle of operation and end of the day as i mentioned it's sponsor motivation recon injecting the guy or the malware collecting the data what we call the lateral movement mm -hmm. and upload the data outside in a several ways so if you look on a penetration test kill chain the the lockheed martin mm -hmm. one it's not a, a a far away from the insider because end of the day you are using malware human or the combination or the hybrid mode end of the day it's the same but on top of it if i'm looking on on from the executive level it's always around the motivation how how mm -hmm. long you have money to fund the operation what is the motivation and what is the budget around it because as i mentioned the people that get the data never get involved it's always subcontractor and the good espionage of insider it's two level of proxy somebody hires somebody that hires somebody so the mm -hmm. destination you will never know the destination in this area deception was found as a good technology from my experience is basically supply false information to this insider and even if the first proxy open the file know how to pick on the data of the opening and if you find the file attractive you send it to the end buyer he also open mm -hmm. the data so you get the next one so using deception on the data you basically print the whole route of the data who the who is the one that first compromise it who is the first proxy get it analyze understand that this is what he want and who is the end destination that pay for the breach
and the insider thread itself. So you can print the whole map. And most of the time we see the route from local person, the higher it's cyber gang in, in it, either in, in the Eastern Europe or Latam, Latam, especially you can find them in Mexico and Colombia and Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then end of the day is lending on somebody that affiliate with a very respectable company, it can be public company, private company. And you can see the whole route by just deceiving the insider track, deceiving your user. So this is one yep. of the motivation that we see today, people using deception. Yeah, and, and Moshe, oh. even the new piece that's adding on is now when they're installing it, it's not even acting immediately, which oh, is giving yeah. the kill chains a problem. So it's installing and it's sitting there silently for two, three weeks to make sure it's not detected on the on the system or the network in a sweep. And then it's slowly doing it through the, through channel, right? So, I mean, that's that's some of the newer techniques to show up that they're trying to do to get around the insider threats that have been planted, right? Which is infect the device or the, you know, get into the user system and then wait and stealthily sit there. They can map the network without having to do anything, just see what comes in and then start to try to move around. So and, patience and, is a virtue. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's always... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, as I said, it's always long sales cycle and you need a sponsor to, to fund it because long operation costs money. Cybersecurity... And the cyber gangs, you know, you pay for the days they work. So this is basically how it works. Well, and so they're of, smart enough to know how to turn off security logs and controls to cover their tracks, right? So that's the yeah. other big problem when you're doing forensics on these types of things. If they were smart enough to know to encrypt it so the DLP couldn't stop it from going out, or if they were smart enough to shut off the logging or shut off DLP or, you know, whatever the application mm -hmm. is, right? Um, yep. They can create back channels and things that you'll never even know that you lost your data. And I guarantee your cyber risk insurance provider isn't going to compensate you for the loss of your intellectual property or your trade secrets. So guys, it sounds like I'm, I'm hearing uh, something pages from some of the movies, right? The scripts like Ocean's Eleven or Italian Job, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a repeat wow. of that. You have the insider. You watch some of these other things. You have a mole inside, and you know, and you guys are talking about it. These guys are extremely patient, right? So I think we have seen the movies, we have read the books. Um, somehow we just think that oh, it doesn't uh, you know affect me, right? I'm not a bank. I'm not a big healthcare company. I'm not a big pharmaceutical. I don't have a Snowden problem. I guess everybody who thinks about insider threat, given the propaganda that, that was around Snowden, they're looking for the next Snowden. What are your thoughts? Is is that what we're talking about? Are we talking about finding the next Snowden? I mean, it sounds to me a lot more than just that. He, he's rare. <laughs> I mean, somebody who blatantly feels their way around and steals intentionally at that level it is rare, right? Most folks are looking for something they can commoditize it, in my opinion, right? They're not looking mm -hmm. to try to wholesale steal and thinking they're the cyber savior of the world, right? He, he's He's interesting, right? Because he's the he's not the typical. The other side of that is real world examples. I'll give you. It's a presidential campaign, and I'll leave them out uh, for what happened. But they were compromised through a user. They got into their into their network, and they were literally listening to their phone calls, reading their emails, and it became a major cyber investigation from the U.S. government that took months and months to unravel to figure out that we'll just call them a way Eastern European country had penetrated this campaign and was literally listening to everything. And mm -hmm. it took them months to get in, to Moshe's point, right? And others, they were they patiently figured out who they could penetrate. They got in and then they figured out what was there and they started mm -hmm. taking it. A and that took time. They had to have the person, the device, understand the vulnerability. And that's critical if you're going to succeed in this, in that long-termer game. In the short-termer one, then you might just come in and just start stealing stuff. You know, if you're not in there for the long haul, it just depends on your target, Tony. Got it. What's so, your goal? Guys, uh, 100%. Um, so I guess we're talking about this because I shared some data point. We hear about it. But what has changed? What are some of the macro trends that are changing? Why is this a bigger you know, challenge that it's been before, right? So I'll open it up. Uh, I don't know, um, Costa, uh, Brian, 
you guys want to take that on comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I can talk about we we do investigations for our customers, right? So we we're seeing a lot of different trends right now. But I think going back to the social engineering conversation, there's been a lot of triggers for the attackers to social engineer people. You know, we had COVID, which everybody was concerned about, nobody understood. Then we had the great resignation. You got people that are leaving. We don't know what they're taking with them. And now we've got, you know, a recession that's building and there's, you know, inflation and employees can't make their dollar go as far. They're not sitting in your office anymore. So you don't know what they're really doing at home. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of side gigs. A lot of employees are doing side gigs right now. And a lot of those side gigs, if they're, you know, from an attacker group or, you know, somebody has been duped into thinking they're going to make a million dollars, you know, trading stocks or something, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that social engineering is kind of coming into play right now. And so we've seen a 175% increase in insider um, risk uh, investigations in our practice mm -hmm. just the last year. That, that's a big number, right? I mean, I guess what, what you're referring to is if the side gigs are happening, chances are with the economy, they're probably using the same laptop that they have, right? Mm -hmm. And we talked about BYOD. So yeah. it's not just a, a spam anymore. This is purposeful people with, you know, you can better target them. They go there and the hope is they're coming to whatever gig that you're giving them. They do the gig, but you plan something in their laptops. And if you're using a VPN, boom, they went stealthy into the network using existing protocols and all the goodness has happened. And then now you're already blinded to your DLP, to your thing and that. So yeah, this is just going back to worse. Um, Costa, what are you seeing? I mean, you're, you're kind of on the um, bleeding edge, right? You're trying not to solve for problems for today, but also future proof us, right? From, you know, I guess the other type that we talked about, the nation sponsored attacks. Yeah, exactly, and, and we see a lot of that. So just, just as my colleagues have been saying, um, it, it comes down to the assets that, um, uh, that the attackers want to exfiltrate, but also their ability to stay persistent and, uh, and basically how much does that asset mean to them. Uh, for example, nation, nation state, state attackers can, uh, can loiter in that, um, uh, in that environment and continue to be malicious for extended periods of time. Um, financially motivated attackers now are becoming much more sophisticated and they are um, bringing on this, uh, very similar capabilities to be able to stay in those environments for a long time. So those uh, smash and grab jobs that, uh, that we'll grow up with um, are becoming less frequent, uh, especially when, uh, when the asset itself dictates that uh, there is enough value there. So, you know, before I went into quantum, my, um, uh, I was a CISO in financial services. And, sure. um, and what was really helpful there is that we started looking at uh, the assets themselves and how do we de-risk, how do we protect them, rather than looking at the vectors themselves. Because the recognition is it's, um, we can be chasing vectors forever and there will be new vectors that, uh, um, that come up online, new capabilities, um, that attackers are able to um, uh, to develop. So because of that, if you're looking at uh, the assets themselves and how do you protect what is important to you? And we classify the asset as something that's valuable, something that's important to the company. It doesn't have to be a financial asset. It could be data. It could be uh, employee information, HR information. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be a process. It could be intellectual property. It doesn't matter. What, what does matter is what kind of a defense are you going to put up there and, and how are you going to prevent it? And then how do you look at the risk as, a, as an overall holistic part of your cybersecurity uh, practice, right? Because mm -hmm. it's never mm -hmm. just one place. It's never just one person. It's always, you know, data itself is a living, uh, is a living entity, right? You create yep. it, you move it, you share it, you copy it. Uh, you back it up, um, and and that means that the same piece of data can actually reside in a bunch of different places, but it can also be in transit itself, right? And Absolutely. that's uh, and that's where you really want to see, you know, what does that asset mean to me, and how do I protect it throughout its entire life cycle? I, I think about um, you know, Costa, you bring a great point. We'll touch upon it in a little bit further down when we talk about the concept of zero trust as part of a journey. 
I mean, at the end of the day, it seems like the data is the crown jewels that they want. Like if in your house, you have your jewels, right? You're not going to leave it on the tables or, or your information that you have. So um, you probably have some safes. So what you're saying is, hey, it's time to revisit those safes. Make sure that the, the things that you care most about are protected against the imminent threats, whether it's somebody breaking into your home, whether it's fire or whatever other you know, uh, threat horizon wherever you live. Um, you know, knocking at your door, earthquake or whatever that is, you are trying to protect what's most valuable to you. In this case, we're talking about insider threat. And we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about what do we need to do to further protect that data, classify it and secure it, knowing that this insider threat is on the rise. They're getting more sophisticated or more patient, more tenacious, more organized, it's not a single guy anymore, right? It's part of an organization where they're being bribed, sabotaged or, you know, coerced to do this. This is, this is real, right? So, uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, what I wanted to kind of um, pivot a little bit um, uh, to um, is to ask, why are we picking on insider threat? I mean, we talk about the kill chain, but guys, why, why pick on insider threat? What is different about insider threat? And, you know, um, why does it make it more impactful than other tied up advanced threats or, you know, you know, cybersecurity threats that are so much, you know, uh, on our front uh, and center in, in everyday news? Basically, the answer is very simple, Tony. The damage is always bigger with insider threat. You always get hurt much more than a regular penetration because insider threat is 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 a, is a tag that is focused on the things that is important to you. Insider threat mm-hmm. never come to collect all the data. It come to collect specific data. So if you compare it to any other data breach that you suffer, if somebody from the outside penetrate your organization, you have a chance that you will find the data that's important. You can have a chance that you will find the data that nobody cares. Insider trade is always, you know, focusing on your on your stomach where all the secrets stay. And when he when the insider trade operation is successful, the damage is is you know is 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 big, is much bigger than any other else. Many other things, and and one of the problem is that it's I call it a psychology problem because if somebody penetrates from the internet, you know people can sit and say it was an attacker using exploit zero day blah blah blah. You know we failed, but when insider get in, there is more cycles of people that should detect it get failed. It's not just the security system, it's also the HR, it's also the management, also the direct manager of the person, the colleague. So the whole system of the company get failed. So many people feel bad that somebody cheat them and steal the information because when somebody from the outside do it, he has no face, no look, no no personality. It's a virtual threat. And you can say, I can defend it. I cannot defend it. You know, it's the game of security. You invest more, you get more protection. You invest less, you are more, you are more, you have more exposure. But when somebody human that meet you in the morning in the coffee corner, discuss with you, try to to take from you data in order to keep stealing the data, there is a long cycle of people and and management employees, sick physical security, you know, colleague of this person that get failed on a very basic stuff. How this mm-hmm. guy cheat us? So the damage is financially and also the company moral is damaged because people feel bad for the organization mm-hmm. that somebody cheated them. So it's a double damage compared to other threat. The external trust, internal trust. Um, and uh, I also heard that they're closer to the data, which we just talked about. They have more knowledge. They're further down in the kill chain process. And because they know what is important, they don't have to grab all the data, they can siphon the data that they want, right? So they're much more effective. Uh, that's kind of what I heard. Uh, there was another comment on the panel. Please go ahead. Uh, what I was going to say, Tony, is if you think about, take the example, we'll come back to what Brian was talking about earlier, right? The insider person that you know wants to do maliciously. If you're on the inside, right? And let's say you're the database guy, you've just been hired and you want to go steal all the healthcare information right? All the PII or the PHI, right? That's out there. All of a sudden, they don't have to work to get in. They're there. That attack is faster. It's more directed. And they may actually have permission to be there because that's their role. And they've just been compromised. 
right? Or they, or or they, you know, to Moshe's point, right? That's the MO, right? They've hired a contractor to go in there and be there for a week and just siphon off all of that information, and all of a sudden, it's it's out for sale, right? So it's a much more insidious attack you have to be watching for than the outside, right? The outside defenses, you know, you got to watch for, but companies have gotten reasonably good with looking for that stuff now. There's good tools out there for that and processes. They're not great, but they're getting there. The insider guy like that, I don't know how, I, you know, that, that's a good discussion of, of how you come at that. Yeah, and it's a, it's a psychological thing, right? Because a lot of employers don't want to do surveillance on their employees because, hey, we hired them, we should be able to trust them, right? And and the attackers know that and they play off of that, right? Um, and and the bigger problem is, you know, now if they're not in your office and you never actually have that personal connection with them, it's a lot easier for them to do things that you know might hurt the company because. They're not in the office. They're not in the building, right? And when COVID happened and everybody moved out of the office and was working off a cable modem, you could turn off your VPN and do whatever you want. You know, it's it, the 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 trust level has just changed significantly, and I don't think technology has really caught up with it. Which is why you know at Detex we we provide you know very detailed logging, but we anonymize everything so that the customer doesn't feel like they're surveilling their employees. But, mm -hmm. you know, when, when an employee gets to a certain risk level, then you can, you need to have a program in place to know what to do. A lot of these customers don't even know what to do. If somebody started doing this, do we, do we let them do it for a while? So we can do a forensics investigation on that. Do we stop them immediately? Um, you know, do we surveil them? What do we do? And, and most companies, if they haven't had to go through this before, um, feel bad about setting up programs and policies to do all these things. And that's what I think prevents a lot of customers from, you know, taking those actions, even though they know they should. Thank you, Brian. I think you touched on a previous point we brought up is that that intersection of, you know, privacy versus security, how much of the, you know, observing and governance you provide and infringing on that and changing that morale. And if the morale has changed and you kind of, you know, it's kind of like a vicious cycle, right? You, the, the worst of morale is, the economy is, Moshe was talking about it, right? And then when trust is etched, they say, well, wait the hell, you know, they don't care about me. Why should I care? So you're just kind of creating more. One thing I saw I wanted to share with you guys um, is this, uh, I think it was from the CISA and we talked about it. Can you guys see that? Um, can everybody see that on the, that I'm sharing? It's like a little, you know, we wait. We can, Tony, yes. Okay, so we, we talked about this. I wonder for our audience, right? When we talk about the kill chain, this is a, a similar thing. We're talking about what goes inside that uh, that insider thread, right? And he talks about that, albeit virtually every person will experience stressful events. Most do so without resorting to disruptive or destructive acts. People are wired differently. For those inside that turn to malicious activity, researchers have found that the acts are rarely spontaneous. Instead, they are usually the result of a deliberate decision or act. That was the motivation that Moshe was talking about. And I found it very insightful, right? They're talking about there's some event happening, grievance, you know, there's a preparation, there's exploration, they're moving around, whether it's curiosity or not. They start experimenting and then they go execute the plan and eventually escape. Um, so as you look at this, you look at, you know, we talk about DTEX, like all different technologies, and there were some questions in the chat, we're going to open it up more, but they're talking about, and I wanted to kind of shift the conversation, now that we understand the insider, who it is, what types are, what motivation, what, you know, you know, what constitutes an insider, let's start thinking about, you know, um, the solutions, right? Where do, what are the controls, what are the, the, the you know, uh, early detectors that we can put in, and like you said, what do I do with it? I kind of have to observe, I have to understand this problem, what type of problem it is, and probably are different controls that we can put at different stages of this attack. Some people have been there very dormant. Some people are motivated, going in, pivoting and coming out, right? So um, I wanted to kind of share that and then let's start, uh, you know, kind of thinking about um, and maybe uh, sharing that conversation. Um, so what, what are some of the mitigating strategies, right, that we can think about and anyway, when you look at that that wave, right, that that that, that flow, um, so let's start having that conversation. What can companies do, right, to identify insider threats and mitigating strategies they can put in place? 
So I, I guess we're probably one of the most direct, you know, solutions for that, Tony. And what we do is we actually create a risk score for individuals, um, basically based on those categories that you just shared, right? So if, mm -hmm. if I'm just doing exploration, you know, maybe that raises me to a higher risk level. And now I, as the employer, do I take away certain privileges for certain things? Can I start blocking things? Um, so that if they're doing exploration and they're encrypting files and they're, um, you know, staging them for exfiltration, can I kick them off the network before they do it, right? And so that's the approach that we took is more of a behavioral approach. So instead of looking at each individual technical alert that they may have created, we're creating an overall risk score and then creating policies based on their risk score of what they can and can't do to limit the uh, exposure for the customer. Yeah, and Brian, that's the right approach, right? Is, is you've got to take a risk-based approach to that solution, right? Which is you've got to first define what the role they should be in, what access they should have, what, you know, what permission the device should have, and then you can get down even further, right? Is it, you know, what time of day, you know, what type of device, what type of network, right? Well, you can then get a little bit more granular if you want, but tying it in dynamically to a risk matrix, that's key, right? Because it's got to react in that near real time sense of the world, which is, hey, you know, your risk score has gone up because we see you trying to probe the network. We're going to go ahead and peel back access to certain things dynamically mm -hmm. and see if you keep trying to go there. If you do, well, now your risk scores can keep going up and up and up. And now all of a sudden, it may be an innocent person. Their device may be compromised. It may just be an HR conversation. But whatever it is, you're 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 mitigating risks, right? Because zero trust is, you're never going to get to zero, right? I mean, that, you know, the word is an abused word. You're never going to get there. The goal is zero, right? And so that architecture is a mix of technology, people, and processes. And it, and it has to be if it's going to succeed. It's and, always, right? Yeah, and you have to start with the first basic one, identity, whether it's user or device. If you can't identify, everything else fails. That's step one for every organization. And um, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, let me actually speak as a as a customer or, or at least Please. a former customer. Um, but, um, you know, we have all kinds of controls, right? We can do preventative controls, mitigative controls, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm personally a big fan of uh, leaning with preventative controls, right? So it goes back to identifying the, uh, the assets, identifying what is important to you, which is also going to be the same thing as what's likely to be important to the attack, right? If you, and then, and then putting those controls in place. So users are one of those, uh, one of those assets, right? Because they're easy to go after, they're easy to compromise. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward to go after identity management, but the end goal is all, also tends to be that data itself. Um, and that data itself is, uh, the, it, it begs the question of, you know, how do you, how do you put in preventative controls rather than having to rely on com uh, compensating controls or anything else like that? So in which case, you know, data loss prevention solutions, uh, especially ones that are easier to implement, easier to use, um, and build uh, and build specific rule and policy engines around them that actually look at the data itself. So prevent someone from being able to copy it, from being able to move it, re-encrypt it, um, do something with it. That that becomes a big deal because what it, uh, and then when you couple it with um, with things like uh, training policies, procedures, what it actually also does is even to a, an insider. Um, it uh, it creates this um, this view that um, this perception that the environment is a very healthy environment. In other words, it's well maintained, it's well managed. Your work is going to be difficult. You're placing yourself at a huge risk by going after these assets. Maybe you should go and uh, maybe you should stop, or maybe you should go and change your target and go elsewhere. But but by creating a perception also of how it's going to affect the user, you're actually reversing the social engineering aspect on them. And, and what you're saying is, this is far more dangerous than you expect it to be. Please 
uh, think about what your actions are, uh, and 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 that reduces the the risk footprint on you. Yeah, I think I think you kind of touched on the question that Peter in the chat was asking. You know, what do we do to nullify insider threats, right? I, and I think what you said is is not an either or; it's both, right? It's technologies, uh, it's training, and it's processes, right? I think process to understand your data and certain technologies is. We, we saw DLP was a way to start, but as Brian touched on in uh, the work I've done previously, right, it's not too difficult to bypass those DLPs. I think those are secondary controls that you put in, right? Somebody come grab and can you grab them before they leave in the store? And if you have expensive watches in store, they're probably on a, under a key and somebody, you know, giving one, one watch away, one Rolex away for somebody to look at it. If you ever go to one of those stores, right, there's a guard standing, you know, they, you know so there's a profiling that happens. I think we all need to do it. So it is a combination that we need to do. It is a journey, right? Uh, zero trust is a journey. The, 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 they have their own journey that they're going through. And I think we, it's not like a simple solution. And one thing that I wanted to kind of, as we talk more on the solution, um, let's also, um, you know, decipher this concept of zero trust as we talked about, right? It's, it's, it's a journey. It's not a solution. There's no zero trust solution, right? There is no zero tr single zero trust provider. It's a framework. It's it's a destination you want to get into. It's a change in the way we go about things. Um, and Rufa also uh, um, provided a, a good insight into say, well, are most of one of uh, one's IT providers and cybersecurity solution providers, including zero trust components or providers, also insider threats? I think that's an interesting view, right? Um, if you keep having blind trust in those providers, I think he's talking about the the supply chain problem, right? You can talk about Kaseya and many of the other guards that, you know, the fire eyes and many others that have been, you know, none of us is immune. If you put your trust into the providers, you know, what are you giving away, right? Can you get zero trust, but also maintain zero, uh, zero trust security, but also maintain zero trust privacy, right? How do you do that? Many of these solutions are asking you to trust them to be your proxies. And if they are you know, vulnerable, right? So we're gonna have to uh, keep that concept going um, and realize, that um, we constantly have to assess, right? We need to put, you guys mentioned proactive controls, you know, um, mitigating controls. We have to learn about the profiles, understand, do I have this problem? Brian mentioned that what you guys are trying to do is anonymize it. So yes, I'm not a big brother approach. I don't wanna change the culture, right? I don't wanna demoralize the folks, but at some point I have to kind of assess, right? I have to kind of monitor certain things, right? Certain people working on my key projects is the guy going to project A, you know, trying to go project B, even though you may have a mitigating control that blocks it, do you want to capture on that? Do you want to know every time he goes to project A at certain times, like four or five or 6 p.m., he also is pivoting and going to trying to find ways to go project B? Well, well what does that show you? That's that early stage of his curiosity experimenting and maybe some ACLs or some controls weren't there. And now he has a criminal intent. So um, let's start pulling the string a bit as we have some um, you know, time um, on, on the solution. And I guess the concept that uh, we kind of touched on as you were talking about the, the, the data, this concept of zero trust, right? Is zero trust a good mitigating, nullifying strategy, right? For insider threat. What are your thoughts? Absolutely, it is, right? At least in my opinion, right? And again, it's not going to be any single vendor. It's not going to be any single solution. It, it is an architecture, a process, a framework, whatever word you want to use. But you've got to start with the idea that you shouldn't trust that the over entitlement, over trusting of, of users and devices is why we are where we are. Yeah, and a great example of that was SolarWinds, right? Everybody trusted that if they went to get their update for SolarWinds, that it would be a safe piece of code, right? Um, right, right. But it wasn't. Microsoft or well, keep, keep keep naming them off. Well, and then <laughs> once once the attackers figured that out, what'd they do? Uh, to, to Rufo's point, they went after um, Kaseya and ConnectWise and Datto, right? And if you Datto. can compromise a service provider, and leverage their trusted access, now you've got access to all their customers, you know? So um, it, it's it's not only relevant, but it's happened. And now it's, you know, a key thing when you're evaluating your vendors to understand what security controls they have in place and how there's zero trust in that relationship, just as there is with your employees. Yeah. 
you're starting to see the government try to get on top of this with things like CMMC and other things, Tony, because they're, they, they've reached their limit, right? They have so many vendors and so many attack vectors from that angle that you just talked about, Brian, that they're now requiring people prove that their source code is safe and that they can var validate their entire structure of their, of their, their data that they're supplying to the government, right? That service. But I, I think to come back to the point of, you know, trusting host providers and trusting zero trust providers. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're, if you're, if you're, choosing to route all of your traffic say through an internet-based zero trust service right a proxy you have to make a decision on your risk profile right i'm not here to tell you what's right or what's wrong for you you're going to choose how high your level of risk is and what you want to assign to it and you know do you want your crown jewels routed through there don't you you gotta you gotta classify that risk for yourself but at that point you you have to make that that kind of decision you have to monitor them you have to ask for transparency, right? You have to know what's what, what's happening and be able to validate their processes. If you didn't, then, well, then, you know, you're no better off than you were, you know, just throwing your hands in the air. Um, and I think your point is, is exalted because um, we are talking, whether it's an organic convergence or a forced convergence, I'm not going to get into it, but the ITOT side, right? This is, you see mandates coming down for critical infrastructure. A lot of things can get connected. So as you go through, imagine a sort of a Kaseya or SolarWinds that is used to control not just MSPs, RMMs, and things like that, but actually to control critical infrastructure, PLC controllers, and you know robots, and things like that with Industry 4.0. I mean, I get scared, right? So you know we have to have that balance, right? How much trust you put in those zero trust providers or those who claim to be zero trust providers, um, you know, and how do you mitigate that, right? It is it is a, a making a smart decision, and I think um, you know it, it's not a simple solution. This is why we're having this dialogue, Moshe. You've been in the trenches, man. I mean, you you've been there. You've chased insiders. You've been on the other side. What are some of the anecdotes, right? I remember when we were working together and people were kind of questioning. I guess deception is one part of it, and you kind of had to show them, like, well. Let me show you how easy it is for me to take control of your cameras, right? In <laughs> in your manufacturing, um, maybe maybe there are some uh, anecdotes that you can share. You know, those that you cannot don't share. That kind of brings this real life. This is not a movie, right? This is not. This is real, guys. Yeah, look, one of the big mistakes of the industry was the fact that people was under the impression that let's go and buy DLP solution and we will fix all our problems of insider threat. So people just get the marketing message from all the DLP vendor back in seven, eight years ago that promised them that you can sign the data and nothing will leave the organization. And I do remember I was a CISO and in an insurance company and I got this uh, sales meeting. And one of the things that I learned quickly on the proof of concept is that even if you buy the best DLP in the market, the implementation phase is an endless phase. It's like a product that you need to maintain every day, every hour. And, and, and you know, keep in mind in insurance company, the people exchange data with agent, like thousands of files every day contain very sensitive data, but you cannot approve insurance policy without exchanging data out. So you find yourself tuning the system forever. And end of the day, you are looking on the fine tuning. I do remember that I was run two personal audit on the configuration. I found out that, yes, I, I bought a DLP, but hey, guess what? He will never catch even the basic insider thread because you need to whitelist this one and this one, you need to exclude. People start yelling on you. People from the management call you. Why are you blocking this presentation? We need to raise money. We need to raise partner. We need to bring more agency and business. So people, you know, go after the DLP dream and people just wake up from the dream. They understand no matter what they buy, no matter how much time they invest. Insider threat is a methodology. It's not a solution. Insider mm -hmm. threats start 
with an HR that check the people background, interview the people using some technologies exam and all these kind of tactics to find the person you know. For example, in Israel till two years ago, you had the option to ask the person to bring a declaration from the police that is not criminal. Today, you cannot do it. We follow the American way. But in Israel, till two years ago, we had the option to ask it. The only exclusion we have is just if you work for a, a military or a defense contractor. Other than that, you cannot ask for people. So you know how many cases of insider threat we have in Israel that we can found just for getting from the police the report that this guy is a criminal. And so it starts from the HR moving to the physical security camera. The, the, the employee need to understand there is also physical sensor behind his back go down to the management and and on top of it is the security system policy and procedure of the company. So if somebody on this a, a webinar think that, oh, let's buy a product and fix the problem, guess what? You will never fix the problem because in the insider threat model, you need to understand that you need to defend from a person that from the beginning, you hire him as an employee meaning you trust him, you give him permission, you expect from him to generate revenue and efficiency to your organization, and his motivation is to cheat you. So putting product on people, we know that has never been successful. So the mm -hmm. methodology mm -hmm. is, is a big portion of it. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, many people, many organizations refuse to understand Many organizations go after the technology aspect and many organizations wake up in the morning and found out that there is insider threat inside. And, you know, long story short, you can look on the Twitter fight now between the Twitter company and Elon Musk. And if you read between the lines, you can find that Twitter found several insider threats that nation state attacks was involved, meaning a nation hire somebody, inject into Twitter in order to retrieve data on tweeting account. So they've, they've found three or four in the last three, four years. So when the CISO of Twitter come and say the company bluffing the customers, bluffing the regulation, everybody can access the code, everybody can access the data. So you have an interesting case of a company that everybody here on this call assumed that Twitter spending millions of dollars in security, but you found out that they just had three or four insider in the last three, four years because everybody have access to the data. So it's give you the proof that I guess Twitter either buy this buy DLP solution or even develop and still fail because the overall methodology does not exist. And this is what the CIS of Twitter say on his declaration to the Senate that they don't do nothing as a company while they think they do or declare they do. So mm -hmm. this is basically give you the answer for the all insider threat. Take the Twitter case that in the news lately, it's right. a perfect example that dealing with insider is not just a product technology, it's a methodology. So, so it's a combination of the right technologies, the right methodology, the right culture, and the processes around admission. Is that what I hear? Yep. yep. Um, Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to, uh, to uh, expand, and there is another question um, specifically around APIs we'll get to. But, um, Michael, uh, you started saying that, you know, I think and I agree for the most part, you said, um, when you talk zero trust, you need to start with identity, right? And we, we've heard this, you know, it used to be that, this is my opinion. Um, you guys can challenge me and, you know, I, I love to hear yours. When we think about zero trust and what is trust and what's the source of trust, I actually agree with you that it starts with identity because it's more mature. People have a good understanding of what that identity is. But I don't think that the saying that identity is a new perimeter, it no longer serves that purpose to the conversation we just had with Moshe, right? I know Michael, Michael knows Tony. I can show you my ID and you can show me my ID, Right. And in the you know, digital world, the same thing. But does that make me trustworthy and for what, right? And this goes back to the point that Brian, you were talking about. I think that identity is not the new perimeter in the zero trust. It's the way you start, but it's something else. 
trust is the new identity or lack thereof. And what do you identify that? I say that trust is the combination of identity plus behavior, right? Would you guys agree? How do you measure the behavior? If Tony and Michael is going out, Tony drinks, Tony gets a car, Michael's doing that, Michael is Tony's friend, Michael cares for his life, but also for his friend, and he's probably taking the keys away because Tony's behavior changed. It's the same guy, same ID, but his identity is a new perimeter. You need to know that person to get in the car, but if their behavior changed, how do you monitor that? And Moshe, you were talking about it's a process, it's different, you know, you have to understand, you, you hire someone that you give them an employee. So there's some implicit trust and some explicit trust you do, but don't we need to monitor that, right? And that's the other pivots. If you look at the zero trust, right, it's not just about identity. There are other pillars, right? You need to have the trust for the user, trust for the device, trust for the network, trust for the application, and trust for the data, which was the conversations that earlier on we were touching on with Costa, and I said we'll get back into. So if we think about that, um, I want to open it up and say, okay, let's talk about zero trust. Let's talk about these behaviors. And, you know, what are the, the areas that people need to get started? Michael, you said identity. What's next? You know, well, let's, let's first dispel like- the rumor that uh, that companies have a good sense of identity or agencies. They do not. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those first, you know, it, I almost say it comes down to a phrase we all learned as kids. Who, what, where, when, and why, right? If you're going to implement zero trust, those apply to the user, the device, the network, the application, the data within the application. All of those things apply, right? Who are you? What are you using? Where are you? What should you have access to? And by the way, when, right? Are you the guy who does, you know, Microsoft drop their ridiculous patch Tuesday like they did a few weeks ago where there's hundreds of patches? Do you need to be there after hours to do that? Do you not? How do you, you know, all of those things should figure into that risk profile. But assuming that they have identity down, most companies and agencies will tell you they really don't. They don't have a clue what people are using and where they are and what they're doing. And, and that's that's a problem. That's why I said it's got to start there. But I think you're right, right? That idea that trust gets developed based on the behavior, which is why risk scoring and dynamic interactions, uh, you know, a DLP is one tool, right? So is IDS. So is IPS. So is... You know, so you can keep naming the tools. They need to be brought together and there needs to be a risk matrix that says, this is how we as an organization view this behavior. And as the risk goes up, their access should go down. And the more the risk goes up, then more, you know, to use the government joke, then more the guys with the, the hood and the dark van need to come and drag you out, right? You know, it, it, it's that's the game, right? Is how much risk tolerance do you have as an organization? Awesome. Any other comments on this? I'm going to go to a session of rapid fire questions. And but before we do that, uh, Brian Costa, thoughts? Uh, I mean, just to add to what Michael said, right? You can't manage what you can't measure. And the problem for a lot of customers is they can't measure it, right? And um, you know, a, a lot of people try to take the easy button to things that aren't easy, right? <laughs> um, and and having an, an insider risk program. Or, or even a framework, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it takes time to develop. It takes multiple people in the company and it takes a commitment. And, um, you know, I, I think that the commitment hasn't been there, but I think as more and more people have insider risk issues, it's going to mm-hmm. drive them to this. Um, and, I, and I think it's a, a spectrum, right? It's not yep. just like zero trust. You're never going to get totally get there, right? But you have to take the first few steps in the journey to understand mm-hmm. how long the journey is going to be and what you're going to have to do. And so it's it's kind of a risk um, versus cost, you know, analysis yep. that everybody needs to go through to decide, you know, what technologies am I going to pay for? And, you know, how far is that going to get me? Um, mm-hmm. And is that good enough for now? And then later we're going to move to a, a, an additional thing, right? So absolutely. Um, but but until you can man, you know measure what's happening, uh, it's tough to know where to invest, right? So I, I think that that's a key thing. I love that. I think you know my, my logical mind right brings me to experiences that I had. It sounded like you know the experience I had to go with my kidney stone, right? I cannot go talk to the internal medicine or urologist unless I get some metrics, right? We all go to doctor. They start with vitals. What has changed with you? What's your temperature? Do you have infection? 
Are you, what are your symptoms? What are your chief complaints? What I'm hearing you say is you need to have those vitals. I mean, we're talking about telemedicine, right? To go home, remote patient monitoring, to do that stuff, right? So users are home. So I guess we need a remote patient monitoring for our users at home just as well, right? If you use that analogy. And I think before you go, and I put you in there, I mean, having gone through this, not to make it too gory, but I've gone through kidney stone. Those of us who've gone through it, you know, I don't want it for anybody. But the symptoms were like to the point the doctor says, you may have appendicitis. You're vomiting, you have temperature, you're bending over and blah, 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 come over here. They couldn't do anything. They had to take additional vitals. They had to take, you know, um, liquid samples. They had to do x-rays. They had to take the vitals. And then they were able to discern, do I have an internal problem, an insider threat, in this case, a kidney stone or an appendicitis? And the threats were different and the things were different. So it was funny listening to you. I'm like, wait a minute. You sounded like my doctor, right? And just going there and say, well, let's take the measures. Let's monitor this. And, you know, I think we need to do that. Um, there was a question in particular about APIs that I saw. So um, I don't know if you guys saw that one here. I was trying to read it. Uh, Sean asked, do APIs open gaps in trusted sources for malware to be passed? Thoughts on that? 100%. It's, it's, the, it's a big emerging discussion of how well APIs are being secured in the organizations. And mm -hmm. it's not just within your organization. As SaaS tools have emerged and you're exchanging APIs with those tools, yeah, it, it, is, yeah. A, it is a big threat to organizations and it's a growing discussion in the zero trust world of how to secure APIs. And now there's companies coming out, but you know, again, now it's an air to, how, how is their supply chain, right? Where are they yeah. getting their code from? I mean, again, this is all about a risk program. That's what Zero Trust is. It's a risk mitigation program. Got it. And on, on that note, I was at Black Hat. I met a couple of companies actually from uh, Israel. Surprise, surprise, right? Great minds. And they there's actually looking at a different side of API. I mean, to me, you know, when I think API security, you know, just to name drop a few of them, you've heard about Salt and No Name and anybody else just scanning, just like we used to scan workloads on you know on laptops or on cloud uh, that's definitely you want to find inherent vulnerabilities that exist in apis for sure but what they showed me was very interesting they they weren't doing any hacking moshe like i was looking at this and they were showing me how they went to a bank connected to their apis used their framework and found some you know through some fuzzing in a way that they were actually attacking the api business logic and they were basically able to do exchanges of dollars to something else and doing some roundup function. There was some, you know, arbitrage and they were literally printing money. And they said, show me the hack. So I think there's definitely a problem. I'm not sure what the solution is. There's a lot of people doing that. But I think uh, to answer Sean's question, I think uh, any kind of attack surface, APIs is a big one. And it has to do with that supply chain conversation we had. Um, but again, the message is monitor, identify, follow that that journey that they're having and the journey that you're building. Identity, yeah, but right? Go ahead. The, the, the question, Tony, and I was kind of expecting to see it from the from the audience and maybe it's existing in the q and I'm not seeing it, but one of the basic questions that I keep asking people when we're dealing with API security and insider threat, mm -hmm. do we categorize API breach as an insider threat? Because end of right? the day, <laughs> The API is a kind of trust between two entities, okay? Supplier and the customer or the opposite way. So if somebody penetrates my organization through the API, through other access I gave him, do I count it as an insider threat or not? Because if I hire a contractor for two days a week to maintain my system and he mm -hmm. every week spend two days on my network, I pay him, I treat him as an employee. I gave him a desktop with my software and access and et cetera. And if there is a breach from this entity, either the person or somebody behind the person, do we count it under insider threat in terms of API or contractor? It's a mm -hmm. question that I don't think the industry even discuss about it because everybody tried to categorize supply chain problem. Yep. I personally come from the agenda that say, yes, it's the vector, it's supply chain, but the person behind it, it's an insider threat because I trust the person. I gave him right. an access, either API, VPN, he come to my office every day. I don't know, but end of the day, supply chain, from my perspective, if 
I gave him much access, broader access, not just something very limited. Mm -hmm. My perspective is a, is a pure insider threat risk, an insider threat event, if somebody compromises it through the supply chain. Because again, supply chain rely on trust. If somebody Perfect. penetrate me, bridge the trust, it's like any insider threat case. It's a good question. It is. It is a very good one. On that note, I'm going to do some rapid fire, guys. Um, so, Brian, should insider threat be top of mind? Yes or no? Absolutely. It should be top of mind today for any customer. Awesome. Michael, is it unique to only government financial healthcare entities? No, not at all. Um, are insider threats avoidable? Or do we live with them? Is it like COVID? But they're not avoidable. They're not avoidable because they always change, right? Um, what what technology knows to detect today, somebody's going to figure out another way around it, right? So you you need Got something in place that'll just kind of monitor everything, and and you need to be you, it needs to evolve with the threats. Makes sense, right? It's that that monitoring the vitals, you know. Influenza, cold, COVID is going to be part of our life. So it's insider threat. Um, Costa, can we eliminate the insider threat risk? We can reduce it. We cannot eliminate it. Okay. I'm going to throw a bonus question for you. Can we insure against it? I mean, there's a lot of insurance stuff. We didn't touch on that one, but I want to bring it back in because I think it's a hot topic. Um, why don't I just forget about it and just go get a cyber insurance around it? Well, cyber insurance is all good and well, but uh, if you damage your reputation and you lose your customers, you are never going to recover from that. So the short answer is no. So they're not got, they're paying monitoring for credit is not a solution, you're saying? It's a, you know, don't worry about the answer to that question. Well, uh, it, gets, <laughs> it gets worse there, Tony, because the cyber insurance uh -huh. companies, if it's state-sponsored yep. now, they're refusing yep. to pay. There you go. And now so, you have to prove that you did the right thing. So cyber insurance is not worth the paper it's written on. Do not right. buy it. No, you it's fine. It's, fi it's funny now, Michael. Now organization, instead of investigate the breach, they need to prove that is like a regular hacker and not a nation state hacker. And then when you come to the insurance and say, hey, it's not a nation state, it's a regular hacker, they will come and say, how you cannot defend a regular hacker, you're supposed to buy a good system to protect against regular hackers. So now you That's need right. to discount it. Now you need to discount yourself as an organization, kind of you, you humiliate yourself and say, no, no, it's not a nation state. It's a regular hacker, a script kid. Pay me the policy. And then they will come and say, oh, it's a script kid. So why your system failed to detect script kid? So it's a, it's like, you know, 20, 22 That's, games. So, so I said to stop funny. buying it. Invest that yeah. money in, in better integration and better dynamic tools. Stop, stop investing in something that's not going to save your reputation because you may get the so money, but your reputation's gone. So you're if saying you ask, you're guilty. If you ask me, the insurance company, my personal feeling and thought, the insurance company want to kill this, the product of cyber insurance. They understand they're losing a lot of money and insurance company cannot control the business in cyber. They can control when they sell cars and an apartment. They have a lot of calculation to know how many, how how long they can stay on the market. Cyber security, especially in the COVID-19 that everybody got breached, give them the understanding. And I'm speaking with a lot of insurance people because I came from this industry. So I have a lot of colleagues. They want to kill this service. So they afraid from the regulation because they, the, the country will find out that this guy is trying to escape from some of the duty. They try to kill the market slowly and softly by saying nation state, we are not paying, you need to prove nation state. You're proofing, oh, why script kid hack you? We, can, we not pay. They want to kill the market. This is the game, guys. In three, in three years from now, no cyber insurance. Nobody will buy. Killing you softly. That's what you heard from Moshe. So I, I also heard that when you're done with insurances, the laws are backwards. You are guilty until you prove innocent. Due diligence, due care, you have to make sure. Uh, and, and I think Moshe, when you said, I remember there was an article a few weeks back that actually stated that, that they're removing the state and uh, nation-sponsored clause from their uh, policy payouts, right? And uh, they have that. So uh, you have to prove that this was not a uh, state nation. Very interesting points. Folks, I just want to thank you. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, hopefully we got to everyone's 
questions. We talked about it. Um, uh, we need to monitor. We need to understand. We need to um, identify resources, data, folks. Um, we agreed that zero trust can be a good mitigating strategy. Uh, insider threat is here with us, uh, much like other threats. We need to be able to follow their uh, journey as we build our zero trust journey. So uh, hopefully this was, uh, you know, uh, a good conversation for our audience. I want to thank my panelists, um, Michael, Brian, Moshe, Costa. Thank you so much. And again, my, my, my thanks to our sponsor, Gorilla and TBI for making it happen. Um, if you guys have not been uh, going to Thortra Brida Institute, please come. We are uh, a think tank trying to really solve these problems through collaboration and sharing, right? It doesn't take one person, it takes a village. So um, thank you all. I appreciate you. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Thank you.